know, tonight's lecture will, will stimulate a lot of discussion and provoke people into asking questions. So, because I suppose it's still a fairly controversial topic in, uh, in West Mayo and in Ackle. But um, Patricia, is from, who is from Mayo originally, uh, but who lives in Limerick and who studied in Maynooth and in uh, UCG or NUIG, um, is going to talk about. She's published a book earlier on this year, uh, The Preacher and the Prelate which is a great uh, account of the Ackle uh, colony in Dugort, the Protestant missionary colony that, that was set up in the 1820s. And I su suppose by way of background, I feel that I have to, from my background, uh, originally from Maynooth, I feel that I have to fill in a bit of the background for you, just in shorthand before I introduce Patricia, just that this, the 1820s and 30s, you had this wave of, of Protestant evangelicalism across, Ireland, across Europe, really, but particularly across the islands of Ireland, and Britain, and uh, uh, um, it was sometimes called the Second Reformation. And a lot of enthusiastic Protestant missionaries, especially, descended on the west of Ireland, particularly. And some of them, as in the case of Nangle, who went to Michael, came from the part of the borderlands that I'm from originally, up at Monaghan and Cavan. And Nangle came from Cavan, and I was surprised to find that he was inspired by Lord Farnham in Cavan, uh, who was a who was a, an avid uh, Protestant evangelist himself in the 1820s. So uh, Edward Nangle came to, to Ankle and set up a colony in Dugort. And again, I was thinking in terms of context that this was, this was happening all over the British Empire, you know, that they were setting up colonies in the, out, in the outlying parts of the empire, like New Zealand and Tasmania and so on, to try and civilize the natives. And in a sense, that's the way you could, you could look at Dugort, and maybe to some extent, Letter Frank and other places down the west coast, that little colonies were set up. But in any case, uh, that's the, the background, and Patricia is going to fill in all the details because she has all the details in her book, The Preacher and the Prelate, published earlier this year. And it's a fascinating story, and it's really very well written. Uh, it's a, a sort of racy account of what happened, with lots of references to, to the original sources at the time. And she's also got a book called uh, The Veiled Woman of Ackle, is obviously, being from Mayo, that's understandable. But, and, but Ackle itself is such a fascinating place in terms of landscape and history and so on. The Veiled Woman of Ackle, again, is about a controversy uh, or a, a, an incident that happened in the 1890s. And it, I think it probably inspired uh, a scene to write The Playboy of the Western World. But you can read it with that. Both books, The Veiled Woman of Ackle is a, and The Preacher and the Prelate, uh, are here. Copies of it are available if you want to buy them. Uh, the, the latter is 15 euro and the, the, the Veiled Woman of Ackle is 10 euro. And Patricia's bought her own copies for sale. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Patricia to talk about uh, salvation or starvation, the legacy of the Ackle Mission Colony. Thanks. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for coming out on a cold evening. Uh, thanks to Westport Civic Trust for the invitation. Um, the Preacher and the Prelate, um, as you see, uh, is the topic for tonight. It's particularly nice, as I was looking out my window out onto Clue Bay, could almost see Ackle, I think. And of course, the whole Clue Bay area, Westport, Newport, uh, as well as Ackle, all became involved in the enterprise, which was Edward Nangle's Ackle Mission Colony, which spanned 50 years of the 19th century. Um, you will see from the title of my presentation that the story has of Edward Nangle and his colony has been fiercely contested, particularly in the Great Famine years, when the charge of superism, of offering food and material inducements for conversion, were levelled against the Ackle Mission. And as I discovered, it's controversial to this day. Just a little about myself, as Patrick mentioned. Um, uh, he mentioned about my first book, where I became obsessed uh, with Ackle and with his dramatic stories. I'm a native of County Mayo myself, was born in the townland of Greenwood in the parish of Bacon, between Knock and Ballyhonus. And I'm glad to say my brother and his wife and my sister have traveled long distances some, some across from East Mayo, to be here this evening as well. Most of my adult life has been spent in Limerick, working with Channel Development in regional economic development. Uh, and in recent years, about a decade ago, I took an MA, an MA in writing at NUI Galway, 
and got interested in writing uh, narrative non-fiction. In other words, using uh, research and factual resources, but trying to write almost like a novel, by, but by being faithful to the sources as well. Um, and for any of you who haven't read the book, I would like to reassure you that it's not a heavy ac academic poem. It's a narrative history. And you will see from the very first chapter that I've actually framed the book in terms of my own personal journey, trying to follow this story and trying to understand in a very personal way what it was about. Um, you will see that the story starts with me being at a Heinrich Bowl, they do a, a, an annual arts festival in Ackle every year called the Heinrich Bowl Festival. And I'm not sure, Val, you might have been at it, but there was a presentation on Edward Nangle four or five years ago. And um, uh, over in Muilin, which was the other side from the Gorge, where the Ackle Mission Connolly had expanded. And I was absolutely taken aback when, um, after the presentation, there was an eruption of argument and quite strong emotive feeling. And this, I think, took me by, um, by surprise and many people there, almost 200 ye years later, that this the story of the colony could still excite quite a lot of emotion. I think you would agree with that, Val. Um, so what got me into writing the story? First of all, I have to admit to an obsession with Ackle Island stories, um, having previously written The Veiled Woman. And I've spoken about being at the Heinrich Bowl and what happened after that and the fierce argument that, that erupted uh, between those who felt that Edward Nangle had brought, and I, being involved in economic development, would understand this, had brought development, had brought land reclamation, had brought medical services, had brought schooling, um, and so on to Ackle, versus those who felt that he had robbed the people of their soul, uh, particularly during the famine, where people uh, converted in return for material benefits. I think I realised that day, almost five years ago, that the Ackle Mission Colony, particularly in its operation in the Great Famine years, had left a residue of hurt, bitterness and trauma which per persists to the present time. While the story is played out in the remote and confined area of Ackle Island and probably the greater Clue Bay area, it is, I believe, a microcosm of the larger Great Famine story played out with incredible drama and tragedy on the western Atlantic seaboard. That was the day that I decided I would follow the story, and I'd like to quote from a prologue, if you get to read my book, uh, you'll see in the first chapter, it's in the present tense and in the present time. And I'm just quoting from the prologue. What are the rights and wrongs of the Ackle mission, and how can these distant 19th century events excite such passions? I realise that beneath the emotive exchanges, large and weighty issues loom. What happens when an outside force with a vigorous agenda descends upon an isolated community, when the forces of religion, imperialism, famine, and landlordism coalesce like a whirlpool in a remote Antic Atlantic island. What brought a stream of 19th century visitors to Ackle to commentate and to look at this development with fascination? I am hooked by the story. I decide to retrace these events, to walk the places where they were played out, to search the archives, and to listen to the stories handed down by the people, uh, end of quote. So in other words, I set off knowing there was enormous amounts of research, but I didn't rely just on the research. I actually traversed and walked the places, in a, not just in the colony, but in Wheelin, in the deserted village and so on. I also listened and lo looked up the oral history, which is quite a different uh, line of, of, uh, to follow, and I talked to some of the older people in Ackle. So it was, and in all of that, I was trying to figure out for myself, not in, a, in an academic, uh, dispassionate way, but just in a fair way to try and figure out this story for myself. If I just uh, uh, divert at this stage, um, when I started to write the story, I wrote a piece in the Irish Times, in the Irish Woman's Diary, about Eliza Nangle, Edward Nangle's wife, who, uh, was a broken woman, really, from a young age in Ackle. And a woman uh, emailed me 
and she said I was delighted to read about the Ackle Mission Colony and to read about the hard times and at the end in her last line she said and I it was particularly good to read about my great great grandmother so this woman was Edward and Eliza Nangle's great great granddaughter so we went on to become friends and um, she shared a lot of family archives with me family bible children's scrapbooks and you'll see if you've read the book you'll see how these feature in the book and when I launched my book in Ackle uh, a few months ago, she spoke at the launch on the actual site of the Ackle Mission Colony. So it's one of the unusual things that can happen when you're doing research. So picture a scene at the start of this amazing narrative. It's a Friday night on the first day of August, 1834, a century before the Great Famine. Darkness is closing in on Dugart Bay beneath Schlievemore Mountain in North Ackle. A sailing boat, a traditional hooker, emerges out of the darkness. A welcoming group and a bonfire await. There are four people on board. The young clergyman, Edward Nangle, his sister-in-law, Grace Warner, the Newport rector, William Stoney, and a servant. The boat also carries the personal belongings, the entire personal belongings, of the Nangle family who had, who had been based in Ballina. A few days later, Edward's wife, Eliza, and their three little girls, Frances, Henny, and baby Tilly, all under five, arrived to join Edward, and they set up home in a house on the slopes of Shreve Moor, where the complex that was to grow into the Ackle Mission Connolly was emerging in what must have been an astounding sight for the Ackle Islanders. These were two-story slated houses where I think there was barely maybe a Coast Guard house was slated. Um, an amazing sight growing up um, on the side of the mountain. The young family arrived at a place with no roads, no schools, no shops, where access to the nearest town of Newport was by sea with the most inhospitable climate. The effects on the health Sorry, I've forgotten about my. <laughs> they're all, um, they're all photographs. So that's just uh, that's Edward. If you go to Dugart, I'm going to St Thomas's Church. Uh, you will see plaques, a lot of plaques to the Ackle Mission, and this is uh, this is Edward from the uh, plaque. This is a watercolor. Edward was quite a good watercolorist, and in fact, his um, his great great granddaughter has made given presentations in Ackle on his watercolours. Um, from the young family, oh yeah, I've, I've given that. Um, the effects on the health of Eliza and Anger were severe. From the very beginning, she seemed to have been a broken woman. In the first three years of the family's life on Ackle, she suffered the death of three newborn sons and her mental health was already deteriorating. She died in her 40s, just at the end of the famine. The question arises, what caused Edward Nangle to make the astounding decision to move his young family to Ackle and to set up home on the Ackle Mission Colony? Um, his wife would have come from quite a middle class, um, uh, comfortable uh, background. So it was an astounding uh, change for her and had an immediate effect on her health. Patrick mentioned the background to this, and I think this is quite, quite fascinating because there are three phases to the Apple mission. The first phase, the 1830s, the decade before the famine, then the famine uh, years, and then the years afterwards, which is more about land. And all of those phases, it's fascinating to me how they're, they're intertwined. It was a decade, it was uh, in the 1820s, as Patrick mentioned, when uh, Edward, a volatile young clergyman based in Arva, County Cavan, uh, became imbued with the spirit of the Second Reformation, particularly on the Lord Farman, Farnham estate. The movement was linked to a belief of the Second Reformation that the root of the problems of the Irish peasantry was Catholicism, or Popery as it was referred to, and its priests. While Protestantism could provide the people with the moral character and the enterprise and the civilization necessary for an economic progress, so this was kind of the philosophy that imbued, uh, that he became imbued with. And Lord Farnham put this into effect on his own estate uh, through the work of a moral agent. In other words, somebody who worked on the moral side of the development of the tenants. 
Um, and in Lord Farnham's view, this led to better tenants, tenants, more productive tenants, and as a result, a better estate. The young and rather fragile clergyman, Edward Nangle, was then based in Arba, as I mentioned. He had also read the work of Christopher Anderson, the Scottish clergyman who believed that the Bible should be brought to the people through the medium of their native language. So the other aspect of his work was that he would bring the Bible, and in fact, when he came to Ankle, all his pamphlets on the Bible uh, were translated into Irish. After recovering from a severe breakdown, Edner, Edward became imbued with the vision to bring the Bible and an evangelizing colony to the most destitute spot in Ireland. The vision of the Ackle Mission was born in many ways modelled on Lord Farnham's estate, the conversion of the people primarily through scriptural education and the improvement of their physical conditions. He viewed popery and its priests as the root of the ills of Ireland and of Ackle. What developed in subsequent decades was raw, emotive and tempestuous. In the first decade in the 1830s, um, we kind of forget when we talk about superism in the, in the famine years, I think it's really interesting to sort of know that superism as defined in terms of giving material benefits in return for conversion. It was very much there in the, in the, in the decade prior to the, the Great Famine in Ackle. And in fact, I find it very interesting that, that the public, what, um, Lord Farnham used to conduct public recantations where people publicly recanted their faith and um, Edward Nangle brought this to Ackle and in fact this was being practiced openly in Ackle uh, prior to the famine. He actually stopped it in the early year, in the early months of the famine, probably a bit embarrassed that it didn't, it really shouldn't be done in such a public way. So the first decade of the 1830s up to the mid uh, 1840s, the, the battles in Ackle were between Edward Nangle and his fierce foe, Archbishop John McHale, who became Archbishop of Toome in the very month that Edward Nangle arrived in Ackle, and the two became fierce sparring partner, par, um, partners. Very similar, larger than life, uh, great orators, <coughs> great polemicists, um, and they, so I don't know, did they ever meet? I was never able to establish that they met, but they constantly wrote open letters to one another, made speeches about one another, and they fought out a fierce battle around education because there was little or no education in Ackle um, before, before they ar ar arrived, or before the Ackle Mission arrived. This is a woodcut of the Ackle Mission from John Barrow's book, and you can actually see the quite idyllic landscape and the, the cultivated fields out front, um, the houses and the cultivated fields right up into the mountain at the back. Um, it became a thriving settlement of houses for within a few years, farm building, schools, hospital, printing press and orphanage, a piece of civilization in the midst of the most destitute uh, um, uh, condition of island poverty and squalor. It attracted visitors like Lady Franklin, Caesar Oshawa, Anne Maria Hall and her husband Samuel, and of course, Asenet Nicholson, the American philanthropic uh, widow all of whom would have instinctively supported this good work, bringing civilization and services and development to a place like Ackle, but were a bit skeptical about some of his, uh, of his means. By, by 1837, um, which was four years into his um, um, development, he did one of the most extraordinary things. Um, Edward Nangle set up the Ackle Missionary Herald with his own printing press in the colony. And there's a great scene. The Ackle Missionary Herald uh, was on the go for about, he edited it for over 30 years. And it was one of the joys, but um, not very joyful things, having to go through these uh, mountains of Ackle Missionary Heralds in the National Library in Dublin. But they're full, it's a wonderful, uh, source. So he set this up in 1837 with his own printing press. He edited it every month, and it became his means for sending his message. He was a, he was a wonderful fundraiser across Britain, and this was his means for spreading the word of his, his um, evangelical crusade, but also for gathering funds for the Ackle Mission colony. Um, 
um, so uh, to give you an idea, in one year during the famine, he raised £6,000. So you can imagine what that would, would be nowadays. He was a phenomenal fundraiser. But at the heart of what he did in those earlier years was schools. There were little or no schools in Ackle, apart from the hedge schools. Um, he set up schools immediately he arrived. They were scriptural schools where he taught the Bible. And of course, it spurred um, uh, John McHale and the Catholic Church um, into setting up competing schools. The extraordinary thing was, um, those of you who are teachers or involved will know that in 1831, through the Stanley Letter, we got a non-denominational national system of education set up in Ireland. John McHale, crafty and shrewd and clever as he was, was able to draw down funds from the national board to set up competing schools to Nangle, even though they were very much sectarian Catholic schools, but he was able to couch them in such a way that he, that he got funding. So all of a sudden you had an explosion of schools across Achill through the 1830s, and that's really where the battle was fought out in those schools. So that gives you an understanding then of what happened during the famine. <clears throat> um, it was in these scriptural schools that the practice of feeding the children in the famine years took place, a practice which, not surprisingly, gave rise to an avalanche in demand for entry into the colonist schools and subsequent charges of superism. Um, talking about John McKay, one of the scenes that I really enjoyed writing in my book was John McKay used to make regular uh, visits to Ackle um, after um, Edward Nangle arrived. And there's one very dramatic scene where he arrived and um, he um, used to have these big outdoor masses. Uh, those of you who know Keel, and at the end of Keel Beach, the Cliffs of Manon, he used to take up, that's where he used to take up residence, have his mass, give his speeches. And of course, if you look across from Manon, you're looking straight across, across at Shreve Moor. And in one particular visit, in a spectacular open air mass and ceremony, he called down fire and brimstone on the Ackle Connolly, pointed across to Shreve Moor and shouted, there is no place outside, outside of hell which more enrages the Almighty than the Ackle Connolly. <laughs> the drama and strife around schools and education in the pre-famine decades laid the seeds for the conflicts which emerged in the famine years. So in other words, the, what happened in the famine didn't emerge out of nowhere. It emerged out of that decade of conflict uh, around schooling and around this plethora of, of, of schooling. One of the things I mention in my book, and um, actually I noticed one of the reviews on um, Amazon UK, if any of you are inspired to drop a review, particularly a good one, it's so you can put them up on Amazon UK. <laughs> but one person took issue with me about this because um, I read quite a bit. It's clear that Edward Nangle was a very volatile um, personality, had a collapse as a young clergyman. And at times of great stress, particularly in the early months of the famine, he would collapse. He would literally collapse. He used to go on lots of trips to the UK, particularly over the winter months, and Eliza would be left on her own with the children. And he would often collapse over there and spend several months um, um, laid up. But I, I came to the conclusion, after reading quite a lot about it, that he had a lot of the characteristics of a bipolar disorder. He, he was enormously creative enormous um, uh, output, particularly writing, editing, a commissionary hurl, doing his fundraising, and then he could collapse and have really black moods for months on end. I say that because at the beginning of the Great Famine, he was actually missing, he was absent for about six months um, through total collapse, part of it in England, and uh, partly while uh, <coughs> Eliza was having yet another um, pregnancy ending in the death of uh, a baby. It was in the Great Famine years that the polarisation of views over the Ackle mission exploded. Did Edward Nangle and his colony save many from certain famine death through relief efforts, employment schemes and feeding the children in the schools? Or did the colony exploit a vulnerable people by bribing them to convert through food and material benefits, in particular by feeding the children in the colony schools? It was a fierce charge. And what was interesting, as the charge emerged during the famine years, it wasn't only from um, non-Protestants or the Catholic side, but even within the established mainstream 
Church of Ireland, including people like the Marquis of, of Westford, um, Assonant Nicholson, and many people were, uh, I think, slightly put out by the, the vehemence of his attacks on uh, Catholicism, particularly the Eucharist. And there's a chapter in my book where there's a famous <coughs> um, public debate in Castlebar Courthouse. Um, Edward Angle is involved on one side chairing it, and you have the, the priest from Newport and the rector from Newport, and, it, and it's about the Eucharist. And at one stage, somebody hops up in a table holding a Eucharistic wafer and saying they had taken it from a church and just challenging people to, to say, do you believe this is, is this just a bit of paste or is it the year real deity? So you had really um, very heavy antagonistic um, stuff going on and not everybody agreed uh, with, with his methods. In the early months of the famine, Edward Nanger was suffering a recurring about of ill health and spent several months in the UK while his wife gave birth to another stillborn child. In fact, the family was largely absent from Ackill in the family years, spending most of their time in Dublin because illness was really beginning to take hold of, of Eliza. So they were actually, but he was still very much running it, making most of the decisions and raising the funds. Nevertheless, Edward Nanger was able to greatly accelerate the collection of funds from friends, uh, uh, mainly in the UK, friends of the mission. This was challenged. Um, I, I looked at the accounts for a number of years, particularly 1846, and a detailed analysis, that's the year he, he raised 6,000, he used to raise uh, 6,000 uh, pounds, and he used to pr produce accounts. And it was very interesting to see those, the monies, how the monies, so much of the money was channeled into infrastructure, building up the infrastructure, reclaiming the land, building up an outpost in Muelen, expanding it, building more schools. So huge output on, on uh, infrastructure, a lot of that coming from employment schemes in the early years from government relief schemes, later on from uh, employment schemes, the colony itself run. Um, so it really gives you an insight. It was quite a big organization uh, in terms of its operations. Um, so a lot of it was channeled into colony infrastructure, reclaiming land, erecting more schools, running <coughs> relief schemes, growing crops, importing grain to feed the children in the colony schools. It was undoubtedly true that people in Ackle and beyond who otherwise would have died of hunger were saved by the Ackle mission interventions. And that's just within Ackle. I have a few cases in my book of people coming traveling, walking from other parts of Mayo before the famine and during the famine, asking to be admitted to the colony because it was, they got a piece of land, they got work, they got food. So throughout, throughout uh, Mayo and even beyond that. However, this work became tainted by the linking of the famine relief to the colonies, uh, an aggressive linking of this to the colonies evangelization work. This was illustrated at the end of the famine when there were 400 candidates for one confirmation ceremony at the Ackle Mission Colony in 1849. Almost all of these, 90% of these, were converted Catholics uh, who had converted in the famine years. However, the medical doctor at the Ackle Mission, Dr. Neeson Adams, was the benign face of the mission, laboring to provide medical services to the destitute and the dying while soliciting funds for brogues and freezers to close the destitute, and folklore in Ackle would describe him as a good man. One of the, obviously I had the Ackle mission, Harold Ritter Edward Ang, uh, Nangle's own words, so trying to get a perspective, another perspective, I drew on visitors to Ackle. I mentioned Lady Franklin, the halls, but the most interesting of these was um, uh, Assonant Nicholson. Now, some of you, and particularly if you've uh, seen the um, Atlas, the wonderful Atlas on the Great Irish Famine, Assonant, there's a wonderful profile of Assonant Nicholson. Assonant Nicholson was a, an American widow, philanthropic widow. widow. Uh, she was also an, evangel an evangelical Protestant. She came to Ireland before the famine. She came, she was a really colourful woman. She used to wear polka dot coats. She used to have her Bibles inside her cloak. She, used to, she made her way around Ireland, hitching lifts, walking, staying in the houses of the poor. So people would say she gives a unique insight, and she was here during the famine, a unique first-hand account 
um, uh, of the famine because of her experience with the local people. Uh, in my book, I reference two books that have been written about her visits, and they're really uh, worth reading. Um, she had many things in common, <coughs> Astrid Nicholson. She really wanted to see the Ackland Mission Colony because she believed she had heard about it, and she said, this must be good. This man has gone to one of the most destitute parts of Ireland. He has reclaimed the land. He's building houses. He's teaching. He's bringing literacy. Uh, all of which she approved of, bringing medical services. So she was very anxious to go to the, co the colony. Um, but the pair crossed swords. They didn't like one another. Their meeting was rancorous. They didn't get on very well. And she disliked a lot of what he was doing. She was surprised and disappointed that the mission appeared to prioritize the teaching of the Bible over basic literacy. So while children were holding the Bible, translated in their hands, um, she felt they couldn't, they weren't able to read. They weren't really being taught, and being, being taught ba basic literacy. She was upset at what she judged as a lack of courtesy and hospitality in the way she was received at the colony. It was really very basic to her, and this is what she found going around uh, the country, that there was a basic hospitality, and she didn't experience this at, experience this at the colony. And she objected to the misguided attempts of the colony to bribe the people away from their faith of their birth with food and other benefits. She, she was delighted. She was really interested the way the, um, the children reacted when she brought up the fact of them going to the colony schools versus uh, the adults who were much more uh, guilty and reticent about it. When she spoke to the children, they said to her, we are going back to our own chapel and to our own religion when the stir about times are over, the stir about being the famine food, and when the potatoes come in again. So they had quite a light-hearted uh, approach versus their parents, for whom you will see in the old tradition, uh, it was a real trauma, and the old you'll see, I mentioned later, some of the old tradition. Her verdict was that a lack of empathy and compassion by Edward Nangle and his mission, um, that was her conclusion, it is interesting that this perspective was shared by many within the mainstream Protestant community at the time, in spite of the obvious good work that was being done in Ackle in the famine years. It was after the um, famine, let's see, that's, that's in 1890s, you can actually see their houses are interesting, Schlieve Moor, such a dramatic mountain, and you can actually see the alternating single story and uh, two story houses it was an interesting, um, and then the cultivated gardens out front. And any of you know, you can actually go and visit the Apple Colony today, and there on your left, um, uh, some of you may have stayed in Gray's Guest House, uh, it was on the left, it's actually closed now, it's, it's, it's closed this summer. So um, some, some of those buildings are now apartments, some of them are sold, Gray's Guest House is up for up for sale, I believe. Um, now, there are a lot of trees out front, um, but the main uh, footprints uh, are still there, and this road coming up uh, is where St. Thomas's, uh, we, we, we don't see it there. <coughs> it was actually after the, um, that's Asenet Nicholson uh, um, that I've just spoken to you about, I'll just come to this in a moment. What I find fascinating is what happened after the famine, and which, do you remember I, I said to you at the beginning, that it's as if the, the, the schools in the 1830s, the famine, and what happened during the famine, and then what happened with the land in Ackel, and all of those, in those three decades, all of those seem to combine into a real dramatic uh, tale, I suppose. What happened in Ackle after the Great Famine was, I believe, as important as the famine years in shaping the famine legacy of the Ackle colony. What happened in 1849 is the encumbered estates, one of the um, pieces of legislation brought in at the um, end of the famine, was all encumbered estates, in other words, landlords who had huge debts. There was a court brought in to enable those estates to be sold and to free them, and the belief was that this would make those estates more enterprising and so on. The Catholic fight, fight back started in uh, 1849, 1850. Um, John McHale was getting a lot of criticism about the inroads that Edward Nangle uh, was making. 
uh, so a really aggressive fight back started and uh, John McHale uh, decided that he would purchase land in Bunakurri near Cashel as you go from Ackle Sound um, to Keel. Uh, it's hidden among trees now, but that's where he bought land. And he set up almost a mini colony. He persuaded the Franciscan monks to set up a monastery with schools, with model farms, with lots of the um, elements that, in fact, in a smaller scale, were in the Ackle colony. And that started in the early uh, 1850s. Uh, as well as that, Edward McHale was putting huge effort into persuading those who had converted uh, to come back to the Catholic Church, and he was going to Ackle and he was having ceremonies to welcome them back to the Catholic Church. Um, so the 1850s, um, um, Edward Nagel responded, Edward Nagel took fright when John McHale started buying land. And he said, we'd be overrun, he'd buy up the whole island. So Edward Nangal decided that he would put a huge fundraising campaign, he raised almost £20,000, to buy the, re the bulk of Ackland Island um, from the encumbered estate. And he did that. He wasn't able to afford he, the bulk of it, almost two-thirds of the island. So what he did was he sold off some of the lands to other, um, to other English landlords, um, some of the land ended up uh, in the ownership of William Pike, who himself became a notorious landlord, um, and, and others. But the Ackle Mission was the dominant landlord, the owner of the majority of the land uh, on Ackle Island in the 1850s. So that's quite extraordinary that this guy who came, set up the schooling, became, had a very strong vision for what, what he do, now became <laughs> the, the major landlord on, on Ackle Island. Um, now, there's a lot of, uh, I, I devote a whole chapter in my book because I think Val will know that the land is a, quite a, 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 it became quite an acrimonious thing about did Edward Nangle evict people or did he not? Um, I don't believe he evicted people in, in, in the sense of riding up to their doors and people were evicted, but lands became vacated, obviously during the Great Famine as a result of the Gregory Clause, as a result of emigration, as a result of people ending up there, giving up their lands and going to workhouses. For all sorts of reasons, land became um, vacant. Um, when the Ackle Mission Colony became a landlord, um, it is clear that preferential treatment, and one would expect that, was given to tenants who had an affinity with the colony, who were part of the colony establishment. Also, there were very strict rules in the leases about not setting up churches and papal schools and so on. So now, all of a sudden, what happened was that religion uh, and land become intertwined one with the other. While the Act Commission acquired the bulk of land in the early 1850s, there were charges that preferential treatment was given to those tenants who adhered to the principles of the colony. Um, I've mentioned that some of the land was sold off to William Pike uh, and another infamous uh, uh, lessee was Captain Boycott um, who sub subleased land from another uh, uh, tenant in Ackle and then you had people like Alexander Hector who came and who leased um, the shore rights. So I actually find what happened in the 1850s, I actually say it in my book, the face of Ackle was transformed. If you can imagine, Bonacara Monastery was constructed, there were new churches going up, St. Thomas's Church was built, William Pike built his house, Captain Boycott came and built his house. All of a sudden you had this explosion of development across Ackle. Hector was building up his fisheries uh, after, after the famine. Uh, but bitterness over land was now added to superism in the oral history of the people. This is a plaque to Edward Nangle, um, which you'll find in St. Thomas's Church. And St. Thomas's Church is a wonderful place to visit. It's open every day, I think, all year round, which is really wonderful. Day and night. Day and night. The local, <laughs> the local caretaker there. And it's a beautiful, beautiful church. And it's full of history with the, the plaques and uh, so on. So if you go to Wackel, you probably wouldn't expect it to be open. But you know, as you go along that uh, road, uh, towards the Gort, it's on the left. You can't miss it at the at the foot of Schlieve Moor. The gate at the end of the drive 
and the door of the church are simply closed to keep the sheep out. Keep the sheep out. So <laughs> yeah. People may enter. Yeah. So it was a surprise to me. Every time I go to Echo, I go into St. Thomas's. And it's used widely for recitals and community events and so on. What then can we say about the Anglican Mission famine legacy? Firstly, the sectarian fault lines on the island were laid down in the decades preceding the famine in the early 80s for the religious war fought, fought out by Edward Nang between those two large figures, Edward Nangal and John McHale. <clears throat> Secondly, the activities of the colony in terms of employment schemes, infrastructure <coughs> development, food relief and feeding children in the colony schools undoubtedly saved the lives of people in Akal and beyond who otherwise would have became the battleground for the religious war fought, fought out by Edward Nang between those two large figures, Edward Nangal and John McHale. <clears throat> Secondly, the activities of the colony in terms of employment schemes, infrastructure <clears throat> development, food relief, and feeding children in the colony schools undoubtedly saved the lives of people in Akal and beyond who otherwise would have died. However, these att activities attracted odium in being wrapped around by the colony's evangelizing activities. Thirdly, in the immediate aftermath of the famine, when the Acre Mission became the dominant island landlord, land agitation was added to its sectarian strife and famine trauma in a potent mix that looms large in oral history. You can visit Edward Nangle's grave at Dean's Grave Cemetery, County Dublin, where his headstone is toppled to the ground. He died in 1883 and he's buried with his second wife, um, Sarah, uh, uh, in Dean's Grange <coughs> Cemetery. So he wasn't brought back to Ireland because he had left Ackle in 1852. He'd gone to Screen, County Sligo, which was still very much involved, uh, as you'll see from my book. But um, he spent over 20 years in Screen, County Sligo. Uh, following his death in 1883, there were two very differing responses to him and his legacy. In the pages of the Irish Church Advocate, with its roots in the evangelical Ackel Herald, he was wrongly praised for his bold and uncompromising exposure of the errors of Roman Catholicism. However, the mainstream Church of Ireland publication, the Irish Ecclesiastical Gazette, was a bit more critical. I quote, Edward Nangle was a perfect type of a rugged, uncompromising polemic who fought the battle against Rome with weapons of his own forging, when a gentler and more tender campaign might have achieved more permanent results. Eliza Nangle had died 30 years earlier at the close of the Great Famine. From the start of her life in Ackle, it seemed to me that she was a broken woman, losing a child at birth I mentioned each of the first three years. Her body, she died in Dublin, but her body was taken back to Ackle and she is interred on the slopes of Shleve Moor with the remains of six of her children, five of whom died as infants. So this is her grave. It's actually up at the back. In the, it's in the Shan Relic. If you walk up behind the Ackle colony, it's almost covered now. It's overgrown. Um, and that's where, and I've visited that very often, that spot. It seems kind of I don't know what it says. She's buried on the mountain with six of her children. And she's still um, very much there. And um, she had once, she had a sister, Grace Warner, who actually came with Edward Langer that very first day. But Grace didn't marry. She spent a lot of time uh, with the family, helping Eliza, particularly in her, in her illness. After Eliza's death, because they had three, you know, they had three adult daughters, but the boys were very young, she spent a lot, a lot of time uh, caring for the boys, particularly the younger son, who was very young. Um, I think he was only five or six when Eliza died. And he suffered from a mental illness. He was a very artistic uh, person. And he ended up, she cared for him, and he en ended up in um, an asylum in North Wales. And she lived for a while in Wales to care for him. And she was his main guardian, really. She lived, and I find this really interesting, she, she returned as an elderly woman, an old woman, in her final days. She didn't die until the 1890s after Edward Nangle. And we're not able to find out where she's buried. So I, I think it would really finish off my story 
beautifully if she were buried uh, uh, on Shlieve Moor, but we don't know that Grace Warner is buried uh, near her sister. Um, by the time of Edward and Angle's death, the Ackle colony was in terminal decline, accentuated by the passing of the Irish Church Act, which removed um, you know, the giving of tithes to the Protestant Church, and then later the Land Acts. However, it would be several decades before the Ackermash Mission lands were transferred to the Congested District Board. So this is St. Thomas's Church. It seems to me it looks beautiful, beautiful church, built in 1855. Um, over the summer, I watched an episode of the television program, Who Do You Think I Am? And some of you may have seen this episode, which is an American episode. The American actress, comedian Molly Shannon, traveled to Ackle to re reconnect with her mother's ancestors. The research turned up a document, and it was actually, she had an interview here in St. Thomas's Church with the historian Christine Keneally, and it turned up a marriage certificate from Molly's great-great-grandparents, signed by the Protestant clergyman Edward Nangle in the famine years. Although Roman Catholic before and after the Great Famine, Molly's ancestors had made the decision to marry in the Protestant Church. And you could see this young American woman and her disbelief, like, what does this mean? And Christine Canela trying to explain to her the whole complex set of background behind this decision. So that was a really interesting moment. You could see the astonishment on Molly's face as she talked to the historian Christine Keneally and tried to understand this aspect of her past. It took a while before she grasped that the piece of paper powerfully illustrated the wrenching choice facing her ancestors and the Akko people. They were faced in the Great Famine period with the offer of food and relief in return for a change of faith. The piece of paper, a marriage certificate, powerfully represents an aspect of the Catholic mission colony which became notorious, uh, as I mentioned, during the famine. Indeed, the Black 47 film, which some of you may have seen, uh, also portrays um, this uh, aspect of, of the famine. I mentioned that writing this book was a very personal journey. When almost ready to submit my manuscript to the publisher, um, last summer, uh, summer of last year, I understood that I was not yet finished. There was something unanswered for myself. Where was I in all of this and what impact had the story had on me personally? So I had done all the research, I'd looked at the oral history and I factually I was trying to be as fair as I could. But there was still a kind of question for me, what, what did all of this story and five years of my life that went into this story? Last summer, I took myself off to Ackle once more, determined to climb to the top of Schlieve Moor for the very first time. It was a very daunting, if I don't know if any of you have done, done, done it. I ascended along the mountain ridge in an east-west direction on a clear, cloudless August afternoon. That evening, I attended a concert in St. Thomas's Church, part of the annual Scholacla program. This event became part of what ended up as the epilogue to my book. And I would like to finish by reading an excerpt from my book and from the epilogue. So this is a quotation from my book at, in St. Thomas's Church at the Scholacla program. I tap my toes to the music of jig and reel in St. Thomas's Church, Dugart. Violin, Ellen pipes, concertina, and harp notes soar through the air in the fading evening light. Visitors and islanders alike drum their feet with enjoyment as the talented musicians from the island summer school exhibit, exhibit their musical skills. I sit beside an elderly man and we talk at the interval. I tell him I have been writing the story of the Ackle mission. He looks at me, then says, I hope you have told the truth. <laughs> That's easier said than done, I reply. I hope you have told the truth, he said. I hope you have listened. I hope you have listened to the stories of the people. I have indeed heard the folklore stories and the narrative retelling evoking how those past times felt and the trauma of those years. 
These stories carry an island pain, and I quote two bits of the folklore. They were afraid that hunger would tempt them to take the soup, so they decided to go up to the top of the hill and die there before they would put themselves in the way of temptation. And they went up and they died. Now this, I think, was often thinking what we should have done rather than reality. A second quote, to the old people, the land of Sheev Moor was like a blessed place. They had their houses and living and their graveyard and everything else there and everything was taken from them. End of the folklore quote. And I continue with the epilogue. Concert over, I make my way down the aisle of the church. This is St. Thomas's. There is a large rusted metal container in the corner close to the exit door. That's a soup urn, a woman tells me, from the famine times. They found it in the colony and brought it here. Those were bad times. The traces and marks of the story I have followed are all around. In this church and its cemetery, on the mountain with its deserted villages, in what remains of the colony settlement that appears at times as if it might merge back into Schlieve Moor, the mountain a depository of the bones of history. The great Irish 19th century conflicts around education, religion, imperialism and land were fought out on this island. Responses to the great famine seared and divided a community. The apple mission story is at the heart of these events, a microcosm of a bitter history. Outside, the car headlights tunnel a light through the darkness along the church avenue. I look up at the black, towering form of Shreve Moore as I pass through the gates. I have a sense that having immersed myself in the traumatic charge of this island's history, I have become reconciled with my own past. In retracing this narrative, it is as if I have walked through my own history. I drive away from the island mountain. Um, thank you all for listening. I'm delighted to take questions uh, or comments uh, from you.